So in September, we have beautiful Saturn opposition. We have a lunar eclipse followed by a partial solar eclipse. We've got the best of the planets in the morning sky and we have the core of the Milky Way best seen after sunset. So we also have three shadow transits on Saturn. If you miss these, the next aren't visible for another 15 years. So hello and welcome to the Refreshing Views Observatory. I'm going to start doing these monthly sky guides. It helps me plan what I want to observe. I hope you find it useful as well. Uh, I'm going to put a summary together as well. I'll put that together as a PDF so you can download that. I'll put a link in the description and you'll be able to get that on the Patreon page. You don't have to be a paid up Patreon member, but I'll put it up there for you to go and grab it. And of course, let me know what you'll be observing or imaging in September. I'd love to know what your plans are for the coming weeks. And make sure you stay to the end. We'll be doing the draw for the Colin Stargazing Bible, the signed Colin Stargazing Bible, and the Move, Shoot, Move Rotator. So make sure you stay to the end and we'll draw those names out of the hat. So we end August with the moon at first quarter. And alas, the moon at this time of the year is quite low down. It's right down in the southern sky. And for those of us up here at 51 degrees north, it can be quite hard to observe. I find in my garden, it's often stuck behind the trees, so I can't really observe it. But it's still bright enough to drown out the night sky. So it's actually the worst of both worlds. You can't see the moon, but it's still too bright, still, still bright enough to drown out the deep sky. So as the moon builds towards full phase, we have one of our highlights of the month. We have a lunar eclipse. So this is when the moon passes into the shadow of the Earth and it turns into this, from a white full moon into this beautiful red disk. Now this is best seen from Asia, from the India sort of region. That's where you're going to be able to see the whole of the lunar eclipse. For us in Europe, we get to see the moon rising in eclipse, so we only get to see the second half. And for those of you in the Americas, I'm afraid you don't get to see it at all. It's daytime for you, so you won't be able to see this at all. So make sure you have a good southern horizon and you'll catch the lunar eclipse. My plan is to get out of the village where I've got a good easterly horizon. I'll be able to catch the moon as it rises and then be able to watch the exit, watch the moon exit from the Earth's shadow. And because lunar eclipses always come with a solar eclipse, we have a partial solar eclipse two weeks later on the 21st of September. Now this is really visible only from a limited part of the world. This is visible in sort of Eastern Australia, New Zealand, Antarctica, parts of the Pacific Islands. So if you do get to see the partial solar eclipse, I'd love to hear how you get on. So sticking with the moon and jumping back a few days, on the 8th of September, we have quite a cool sight. The moon is now a smidge past full and it's only three degrees away from Saturn. Now what's exciting here is that approximately midway between the two is Neptune. So if you have a wide field telescope, binoculars or a finder scope, you can get the moon, Saturn and Neptune in the same field of view. So the first thing I notice at this time of the year is the Pleiades rising in the evening sky. So what we consider up here as the winter skies, of course in the southern hemisphere you'll call this your southern skies, so the winter skies are not far away. Now looking at the Pleiades on the 12th, we actually have the moon passing through the cluster. It's quite a cool sight. You get to see the moon slowly blocking the light of the distant stars. Uh, this is best seen from, again, the sort of Asia region. It's going to rise from the UK uh, in mid-transit. And again, from the Americas. I'm sorry, you guys don't get to see it at all once again. Now at this time of year, once the moon has left the sky, the Milky Way is still really prominent. And if you look towards the southern horizon, we have the core of the Milky Way, that's Sagittarius and Scorpius. Moving further north, we have the highlights of Cygnus. And if you look towards the overhead, we have Cassiopeia and Perseus. And of course, if we look away from the Milky Way, we're into galaxy territory. We've got our favourite. We've got the Andromeda galaxy returning to the skies. And I must do a deep dive into the Andromeda galaxy, show you what's all visible uh, in this, what is our nearest sort of major galaxy. At the other end of the square of Pegasus, we have NGC 7331. That still has its supernova in as well. I've caught this at the end of August. Uh, it's still visible, uh, but continuing to fade. So make sure you can catch that one while you still can. Moving back to the planets in September, we're really going to center on Saturn. So Saturn's now pretty much rising at sunset. So give it a few hours until it's nice and high, ideally near the meridian. So it's at the highest and that can give you the best views. Saturn's at opposition on the 21st of September. So this is when the Sun, the Earth and Saturn are all in a line. This is when Saturn's actually closest and therefore brightest 
to the Earth. And again, I must go and do a deep dive into Saturn, show you how I capture and then process some planetary images. So we had a ring plane crossing on the 23rd of March. Alas, that's when Saturn was well, practically unobservable from the Earth. It was on the other side of the Sun. And it's only a few months later, but the rings are now 1.8 degrees. So they're really narrow. And if you look closely, it looks like a sort of ball with a knitting needle through the middle of it. They're really narrow. And it won't be until 2032 that they'll be wide open again. So you can actually track this year after year. You can watch the rings get wider and wider. I uh, see them grow in angle. And of course, if you get a few clear nights in a row, you can actually watch Saturn's moons going as they continue their orbits around Saturn. That's quite cool to go and track. Now, there are three Titan shadow transits coming up this month. We've got two in September and actually a sneaky one in October. So they're going to be a real challenge to see from the UK. They're actually at dawn, so they really favour the Americas. So this is what you get for missing out on a lunar eclipse. And it's so frustrating. We get to see shadow transits fairly frequently on Jupiter. It's quite a common sight. And they only happen on Saturn when the rings are nearly edge on. So if you miss these three, the next occurs in 15 years time. So we'll have to wait until 2040. The first is on September 4th. That starts about 0525 universal time. And that's pretty much dawn in the UK. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see it. So I look forward to seeing how you guys get on in the Americas. Hope you get to see that and enjoy some clear skies. Now, if you missed the September the 4th, there is another again on September the 20th. And this starts a little bit earlier, 0509 Universal Time. Again, that's going to be a real challenge in the UK. The Americas are best place to catch this one. And then the last one is on October the 6th. Now, this just clips the northern limb of Saturn. And once again, for us here in Europe, for us here in the UK, it's pretty much disappearing into the dawn light. Now, Neptune is right alongside Saturn. In fact, it's only two degrees away. So it's easily in the same field of view of your finder scope, binoculars, a low power telescope. And these two planets are actually getting further apart. They were only one degree apart in July. Uh, I like it. It's a challenge to one. Can you find the blue disk of Neptune? And then if you put some magnification on, probably with an eight or a 10 inch telescope, can you start to pick Triton, the moon of Neptune? Now, because Neptune and Saturn are so close to each other, Neptune's opposition is only two days after Saturn. This is on the 23rd of September. And it's quite amazing to be seeing the furthest planet in the solar system. It's 4.3 billion kilometers away. Next planet to rise is Uranus. That's rising at about 2130. And this is quite cool because it's midway between the Hyades and the Pleiades. It's about five degrees south of the, of the Pleiades southern edge. Now, a bit like Neptune, it's a challenge to see the green light of Uranus, the green disk of Uranus, plus the brighter moons. And again, you're probably going to need a 10 inch telescope to pick these out visually. Again, much easier to spot these with the camera. Now, I must admit, I found observing Triton as it went around Neptune much easier to see than the moons of Uranus. Uranus is much brighter and the moons orbit closer in. So I found Triton much easier than I did the moons of Uranus visually and with the camera. Rising at about 0100, we have Jupiter. Jupiter is in Gemini this month and best seen at this time of year at dawn when it's at its highest in the night sky. And of course, if you zoom in, you can see Jupiter's moons. Jupiter's moons are easy. You can see those in a pair of binoculars. You can probably get them on your little smart telescope and they're a fantastic sight in a bigger telescope as well. You'll be able to see all those cloud features as they rush around. Jupiter's at opposition in January, so we'll do a deep dive in December, getting ready for opposition. And if you're looking out on the 16th of September, you've got the moon swinging past Jupiter. Venus is having a fantastic morning apparition. It's gone past maximum elongation in the middle of August, on the 15th of August. That's when it was at its half phase. The disk and the phase are now shrinking. It's preparing to go round the back of the sun on the 6th of January. And if you look closely on the 19th, you've got Venus right alongside Regulus, very close together. And they're also joined by a crescent moon. So it'd be quite a great sight. Mercury starts the month uh, pretty close to Venus. It was at maximum elongation on the 19th of August, but is now racing to go back in towards solar conjunction on the 13th of September. So it's really only observable at the end of August. It's getting pretty close to the sun as we enter into September. 
Mars, well, that's only really visible as a star in the evening sky. It's on the other side of the sun. Um, it's only a 4.2 second disk, so it's practically unobservable. So Mars is at opposition in February 2027. So as we come towards the autumn skies next year in 2026, that's when Mars is going to start reappearing again in the night sky. Moving over to the minor bodies then. So Pluto is in Capricorn. It's a bit of a challenge to, to find. Not only is it quite faint at magnitude 14, so you're into a, I don't know, a 10 or a 12 inch sort of telescope territory. Um, it's actually in a pretty low position from the UK. So further south, you'll have far better luck than us. Of course, it's past opposition now, so be quick. It's not going to be hanging around for much longer. And a bit closer to Earth is number one, Ceres. So this was the first asteroid to be discovered. It's in Cetus, and that reaches opposition in October. Now, another minor body I have on my list is the newly discovered 3i Atlas. Now, this actually isn't a comet. It's not an asteroid. It's an interstellar object. So it's coming in whizzing through the solar system far too fast to be captured by the sun. It's originated from outside the solar system. It's the third uh, interstellar object to be discovered. Unfortunately, in October, it's going to be in opposition behind the sun. So we're not going to be able to see it. But as we turn from November, into December, it actually becomes visible in the morning sky, uh, racing through from Virgo into Leo. So that's one thing, as again, I want to capture, capture later this year. So I'll put a summary table here for you. Uh, feel free to download that. That's available as a PDF. The link's in the description. And if I've missed anything, feel free to put it in the comments. I'd love to hear what your observing plans are as well for the coming weeks. And thank you once again to the patrons. And we've had a 50% increase in the number of patrons. So thank you to Andy for your support as well. So thank you to Andy, Rashpal, and Jacob. Thank you for your support for these videos. All right, so we've got the price order to do now. And the first is the Colin Stargazing Bible that's been signed by Mary. Uh, she came around and visited and we did some blindfold astronomy sketching. So check out her video she put together of that. I thought it'd be good to test us to see how well we can draw blindfolded. <laughs> so we're going to have a look at one of these photographs. We're probably going to try both. Uh, and I did the draw with my daughter earlier. Uh, we went through the list of the subscribers and which country you're from. And this one we picked out was going to Dave A. So Dave, reach out, let me know where you are and we'll get that across to you. And we've also got the triadapter that we took the pictures of Saturn. And again, we've chosen Luke B. So Luke, if you can pick, send me your contact details, I'll get this across to you as well. So thank you for your support. My thanks once again to the Patreons. Thank you to Andy, Rashpal and Jacob. And I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky.